Today on The Global African, we're going to talk to director Stanley Nelson, who put together the film The Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution. I will also be giving a special, very personal commentary on the passing of activist and comrade Tristan Faulkner. That's Today on The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. Thanks for joining us again. Don't go anywhere now. One of the most important documentaries uh, most recently come out is The Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution, executive producer Stanley Nelson. And we have the opportunity of interviewing him for this segment of The Global African. What's important here is that the history of the Black Panther Party, a major radical revolutionary black nationalist organization from the 60s and early 70s, has been told in fits and starts, pieces here, pieces there, some memoirs, but there's been very little attempt to put it together, at least on film. Professor Nelson has delivered that in this recent film, and it has brought with it an immense amount of excitement and interest from all quarters, and hopefully a film that will inspire further scholarship and examination of what happened, including the role that the FBI played in destroying the organization through incredible infiltration and certainly the assassination of key leaders. Join us for this segment. I think you're going to find this quite interesting. All right, so welcome to The Global African. Thank you. Um, first of all, congratulations on your film and uh, incredible responses. That and I, I'm, I'm interested in, as someone who grew up in the midst of the Panthers, was deeply influenced by the Panthers um, and very much affected by the split in 71. I'm curious, um, what was your main motivation in putting the film together? Uh, there was no one main motivation. I think that uh, the Panthers' story had not been told. Nobody had told the story on film. I think that uh, so many things that the Panthers were uh, talking about in you know the 60s and early 70s are things that are still relevant today. So many of the problems, you know, police brutality, unemployment, uh, bad schools, bad housing, those are still things that we have today. So I thought the story was really relevant. I thought that that the way the Panthers were remembered uh, today was not the way they were thought of back then. So the Panthers have come to be remembered by so many people as this kind of isolationist group that was out there on an island by themselves. And that at that time, the Panthers had made you know, uh, coalitions with so many different groups, the women's movement, the anti-war movement, the student movement, and that's not how they were remembered. So I thought there were so many different uh, uh, reasons to make a movie about the Black Panthers. We worked with organizations such as the Young Lords, a Puerto Rican street gang that had become political, and the Young Patriots, Hillbillies, Appalachian White Boys. I want to introduce a man to come over tonight from another part of town, but he's fighting for some of the same causes we're to, uh, fighting for. Bob Lee, who was our uh, deputy field marshal, had a meeting with them, and he was explaining why we should work together. There's police brutality up here, there's rats and roaches, there's poverty up here. That's the first thing that we can, we, we can unite on. That's the common thing we have, man. Cointel Pro and infiltration. Um, a lot of people, even with things that have come out, don't appreciate the extent to which the Pan Panthers were infiltrated. Um, what was your experience in talking to Panthers, former Panthers, about how they dealt with the issue of infiltration, paranoia, things along those lines? Um, you know, I, I don't think there's one answer to that question. I think that the Panthers, you know, um, you know, the infiltration was so complete, it was all, it was everywhere. Um, I think that most of the Panthers I talked to, I guess, would say that they didn't understand at that point how infiltrated they were. 
that they knew, you know, well, they knew their phones were tapped mm -hmm. and they knew things like that, but they had no idea of the extent of, 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 in, of the informers that the FBI had planted and local police departments had planted um, within the movement. So I think that, uh, you know, obviously it was one of the most destructive forces, um, or the most destructive forces uh, that the Panthers had to deal with. And the lessons relative to that for today's activists? You know, I, I, I think that, that, you ju that for today's activists, hopefully, you know, there, some of the film is a cautionary tale. You know, you have to uh, uh, kind of understand what's going on. Uh, you have to be aware of it. I, I don't know how you kind of screen for it completely, you know, but you are going to be watched. You are, you, uh, you know, we've talked to people from Black Lives Matter uh, down in, um, in Ferguson who say they're drones, you know, uh, around their houses and stuff like that. You know, I mean, it's, it's the, you know, so those things happen, you know, f uh, facial recognition software, you know, those, those things are there. So I think, you know, all of those are kind of, you know, part of a, the cautionary tale of, of, of the Panthers. You know, one of the things that I've found, I've found interesting over the years in talking with former Panthers is um, very little discussion about the sort of the internal decision making, you know. I mean, like for example, they they never had a Congress. They never had an elected meeting or delegated meeting to make major decisions. And at the time, uh, no one seemed to feel like it was that important. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that 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 that. Yeah, I think there were there were there were problems. Problem, you know, you can look back at it and say there were problems in the way the Panthers were, you know, constructed with 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 the way they were constructed. Um, you know, besides there not being these these large meetings or or, or things. Um, you know, the 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 hierarchy of the Panthers was was Oakland. You know, mm -hmm. and and so and so there was some. The, you know, people don't talk about that. You talk about you know, people don't talk about that resentment that that there was. You know. Um, because the the leadership was all in Oakland, and so there were there were differences, and and there was no way to resolve the differences. I mean, the the other thing is that you know um, you have this the Panthers, you know that that uh, you know we look at so many times as being you know Huey, Bobby, and Eldridge as these leaders who were never together. I mean, we couldn't find a photo. I mean, we literally right. couldn't find a photo of Huey, Bobby, and Eldridge together. You know, um, and that they were never together. And as someone said, um, I think it's a it's a bite that we ended up not using in the film, but that you know, you know, you you'll believe anything about anybody if you if you never meet eye to eye. If I never meet you and can and can sit down with you, I don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. So if somebody tells me, oh, you know, he said this, he said that. I'm more prone to believe it because I've never sat down with you. So that's a you know. Um, uh, just, just something that, that that happened with the Panthers, and I think, um, you know, helped to fuel um, J. Edgar Hoover. One of the things that uh, I th I don't think that a lot of people appreciate that weren't around that or are younger. Um, you know, as they say, just because you're paranoid that doesn't mean people aren't out to get you. I mean, clearly the the level of attacks. Um, created a siege mentality. Um, and it was a siege mentality that people outside of the ranks of the Panthers and maybe a layer beyond, I don't think fully appreciated and, and maybe wrote off a bit, a bit too much. It was obvious that the government had made a decision that this was all out attack on the Black Panther Party. Every significant office is going to be raided, it's going to be bombed, it's going to be shot, there are going to be mass arrests. In the three dawn hours in Chicago today, police and Negroes fought a... Police and Black Panthers clash in Houston, New Orleans, and other cities. For the Black Panther Party, it was a crisis situation because we didn't have the resources to handle all these arrests and all these trials. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that was one of the the harder things t for us to convey in a film. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you convey paranoia? Right. 
you know, and but I think you're exactly right. I mean, they, you know, uh, J. Edgar Hoover went about trying to create this kind of paranoia, this fear, this not knowing, you know, not, you know, who do I trust, who do I, you know, and um, in, a, in a very, very slick way he did this, and, and he's doing it to teenagers. And he's also doing it at a time when we were, when everybody was less sophisticated about what the FBI would and could do. So, you know, co the, whole, I, the whole COINTEL pro program was a secret. Nobody knew it even existed until 71. So this is a totally secret program, which is now, you know, uh, putting informers, you know, in and, and, and you know, I mean, and, and these are not FBI agents. These are not, you know, your mm. black suit and white tie guys. These are guys who are coming out of jail, and the FBI is getting them out of jail so they can now infiltrate, you know. Um, as uh, Gerald Lefcourt, you know, who was the Panther lawyer uh, for the New York 21 in New York said, that five founding members of, of the New York chapter were agents. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's amazing, you know. I, it, yeah, it is. Um, I knew someone that was expelled and was accused of being an agent. Right. Right. And I definitely do not think that he was, but I've often wondered whether the people that expelled him <laughs> were in fact agents, right. you know. Right. You know, one of the things I also wondered, whether you encountered, this may sound like a weird tangent, but in the aftermath of um, Manny Marable's book about Malcolm X, there was this intense debate. And, and debate is maybe even not the right term. It was very difficult for people to talk about their differences. Um, it was so visceral um, that it, 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 was, it, it, was, it was very, very sharp. And I was wondering, in doing the history of the Panthers, did you encounter that? Did you encounter both major clashes in terms of understanding history? Did you encounter many examples of people not really wanting to talk about it? Um, what was it like? Um, you know, I mean, it, you know, it differed from A to Z. You know, there were people that, that we got in contact with who did not want to talk about it, who will not even you know, you can't say the word panther to them. They don't want to talk about it. There are people who talk about it all the time. There are people who don't want to talk about, you know, certain things. Um, I think that one of the most telling things is, is that, you know, you talk about the split. I mean, there are panthers who you can't say the word split to. If you say that there was a split, they go ballistic. There was no split. You know, Eldridge Cleaver left with some, with some of his people, but that was not a split. You know, I mean, you and they will, they they will like, you know, want to throw down the microphone, you know, wow. if if you say split, you know. Um, we were interviewing a, a, one of the Panther a women who will go nameless, and you know, she said, "What, what, you know, who who else have you been interviewing?" And I said, "We interviewed this person, that person, and we and we interviewed a couple of cops from the LAPD." She took her mic off and threw it down. Said, "If you interview cops, I can't be in the film. I'm not going to be in a film with cops." And it took us, you know, an hour to talk her down from that and get her back, you know, to be in, in the film. And then, but, you know, I'm just trying to tell a rounded story. Because I'm talking to cops, it's not like I'm, like, you know, in a drug gang and you see me talking to cops and you're, like, then going to, you know, he's, he, I'm, you know, I'm just talking to, to police because I think that, you know, I want to hear their side. I want to hear to tell the most rounded story that I possibly can. So, you know, I th think uh, there's still so many wounds at, that are so open. But, you know, when you deal with the Panthers for a while, you come to understand it. I mean, people were physically wounded. People saw their loved ones killed. People, you know, had mental breakdowns. People's lives were destroyed. People have never gotten their lives back together. So this is, this is you know, life and death. This is like no joke, and people are taking it very, very, very seriously. The other thing that I have also seen um, is the relationship of the Panthers to certain other groups like Ron Karenga's group, Us. Right. I mean, there are friends of mine, former Panthers, who will not celebrate uh, Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. They, mm -hmm. Just, they won't. And there is no forgiveness. But let me tell you, I was on a panel a few years ago when uh, that actually the late Manny Marable put together. It was about something about black studies. And 
Karenga was there on the same panel. And even I had this reaction, you know. It was like, do I really want to do this? Can I actually be nice to this guy? And I realized how deep those feelings were. Yeah. Did you encounter much of that? Um, a little bit. I mean, we actually talked to Ron Karenga, who, who, who declined to be in the film, who, that was the first time I'd ever talked to him. I mean, I was amazed at how smart he is. He's a very, he's a very, very smart guy. Absolutely. He's, he's no dummy, mm -hmm. you know, um, he's no dummy. Um, you know, one of the, 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 we get asked a question a lot, like, you know, what did you take out of the film? Was there anything you took out of the film that you wanted to be in the film? And the only thing that, 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 that we kind of had developed and really had worked with really hard to make work was the story of us and uh, the Panthers at UCLA. And um, we actually had cut that story and, and, and uh, we just couldn't get it to work right. And In what we sense? Funny. Well, you know, I, I guess the easiest way to describe it was that we had to do so much backstory to get you there that it just didn't make sense. One, we couldn't find the witnesses to the actual shooting, you know, that, that, that we needed. And so, so we had one guy who was actually there and dove under a table but didn't see anything, you know. <laughs> and so we could get you up to the shooting. But, you know, um, we had to first, so we're now, we're, we're, tell, we're telling the story of the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. We now had to stop and tell you who us was mm -hmm. and explain us. Then we had to explain why they were all at UCLA. You know, mm -hmm. they were part of this high potential program. We had to explain all that. And so now we're five, six, seven minutes into the story and we haven't even started the story yet. Um, and it just, it just, um, you know, it, it, it was, we, we were, we massaged it, massaged, tried to make it work. Um, but we felt that, you know, um, the point of the story was, you know, the FBI. And, and finally we felt that, uh, you know, we were very clear about the FBI's role in destroying the Panthers and that we told it, you know, in other ways and that, um, you know, once, once we kind of, kind of uh, took that piece out because it was a piece and, you know, the film just flowed a lot better. I realize that you are short of time. Let me just ask you this. Um, and partly this comes out of my love of science fiction. Uh, and I often think about... I know science fiction, too. Oh, do you? I do. I, I'm, I'm very much into alternative timelines as a theme in science fiction. And I, I was wondering, was there another route that the Panthers could have gone through? Or do you think that just the forces of history drove it in a certain direction? Who knows? You know, I mean, that's such a hard question. You know, you know, you know, you get the sense that Fred Hampton was a little bit different, mm -hmm. you know, and that might have worked. Um, you know, I just feel like, you know, Eldridge and Huey was never going to work. There were problems there, you know, um, that were never going to be solved. If you didn't have the FBI involved, you know, would it have, inv would it have, uh, evolved into something different, you mm -hmm. know, with the food programs and the other programs, maybe. You also had people who joined the Panthers because of the guns. Right. I mean, that's why they joined. Yes. You know, and that's so right. they were like, well, wait a minute, you right. know, we can f feed kids in the morning, right. but what are we going to do in the afternoon, right. <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, who knows? I mean, I, I think that that energy, you know, could have been used in another way. You know, and, and maybe it could have evolved from the Panthers, or maybe if it had started in a different way. I think that it was important that you, know, you had all this positive energy, and that's what it was. I think that's really what it was. And, it, you know, it, it's also at the time and when, you know, um, and I think this is significant when there, it was before you had the hard drug crisis in, in, in you know, the inner cities and in, in, in African American communities. So you had all these young people you know, had all that energy of youth. You had this, this, this revolution and change that was in the air, and you didn't have this kind of drugs to keep them down or also to get them arrested for having drugs or, or selling drugs. Um, and so all of those things, you know, created this kind of huge, you know, forward movement that hopefully it could have been something else. Who knows? Although the Panthers were one of the groups that was highlighting the influence of heroin uh, into the black community that was coming out of um, Indochina. Okay, right, well, yeah. You know, that's like 
throwing a pebble in, in the water. Right. You know, it's you right. can. I mean, how are you going to do that? You're talking about a billion dollar industry. You know, um, you know, and you, you can't fight it through pamphlets. The film is getting rave reviews, but there are some people, including some former Panthers, that have had issues with it. Um, how do you do, do? You feel that there are those that are expecting that the film. They're upset because it didn't include things that they thought should be included. I mean, what do you think is driving some of this? Um, it, well, first I should say that, you know, um, we've probably, at this point, probably three to four hundred Panthers have seen the film in one way or the other. And we've got three or four vocal critics. So if mm. you had told me that in the beginning, I would have said, yes, I will take that, let's go. Um, you know, if you can also, if you could close your eyes and imagine a film about the Panthers that everybody would like, then, you know, you should make it, because I don't know what that film would be, you know? Um, so we, you know, we knew that, that, this, was that this was coming, that, that there were, would be people that wouldn't like the film. We are amazed at how few there are, how few detractors uh, there are, are to the film. And I, you know, and I think, I think the one thing that I found about the Panthers much more than any film I've ever made, like a hundred times more, is when we have a screening, people stand up and say, what about this? You know, well, why didn't you include Geronimo Pratt? Well, why didn't you include Stokely Park? Carmichael. Well, why didn't you include Angela Davis? Well, what about UCLA? Well, what about New Haven? You know, everybody's got, because everybody has their own Panther Absolutely. story That's that they want to hear. And that, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's so different from, you know, Freedom Riders or Freedom Summer or Emmett Till. And I don't think we were inclusive. I know, you know, I can tell you stories in, 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 in Freedom Riders that we, that we didn't put in, you know, where they, you know, first go down to the Upper South, South Carolina, and they get, in, they get beat, a beat down in South Carolina. But we just felt, okay, you know, there's a lot of beat downs. We can only use one or two. But nobody ever stands up and says, what about that? Because people don't know about it. But everybody knows something about the Panthers. Right. And everybody wants, you know, if you don't have their story. I mean, I got to, to, to so I had a screening the other night, and I stood up, and I, and, and, and I went to the thing, and I said, well, first let me say that Angela Davis is not in the film because she was not a Black Panther. So nobody asked that question, right. you know? Right. Right. I mean, that's how it is. So I mean, I, again, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we, we've been, uh, we're very, I'm very proud of the film. You know, we've screened the film and done Q and A's with, you know, uh, Kathleen Cleaver and Erica Huggins and, and, and uh, Emery Douglas and, you know, mm -hmm. Jamal Joseph, you know, mm -hmm. Flores, Fultz, you know, you know, a, a lot of, uh, and a lot more, you know, Panthers all over the country, you know, who, who understand that, you know, um, you can't and say and do everything. You can't be all things, all people. That's why when Erica Huggins tells us that great story about the elephant and the blind men, we were like, yes, now we got our way, now we got our way in and our way out at the same time because we can't tell you this, this whole story because there is no whole story. Right. Professor Nelson, uh, thank you uh, very thank much, you but also congratulations. Uh, thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you. You're good at getting to it. I wasn't ready when the phone rang uh, for the news that my friend and colleague, Tristan Faulkner, had passed away after battling lung cancer. You know, there's that saying, uh, death and I are old friends. And that's a saying that I feel on a regular basis. But even with that, even with that sort of relationship to death, there's no way to really be prepared for that announcement. Here we had a young man who just turned 40 in June, an activist from when he was knee-high to a duck. He was a field director for the Jobs of Justice, which many of you know probably is a leading labor and community-based coalition fighting for workers' rights. Uh, he was very active in Southern organizing. He was someone who was deeply, deeply committed to the fight for justice. And in fact, one of the things about Trustin was that you could see when you were with him, his utter hatred of injustice. He had a love for people, but an utter hatred 
for injustice, and it came across all the time. He was a fighter. He was making something of his life. I last saw him at his 40th birthday party. He was full of excitement, optimism. Everyone thought that he had defeated the cancer, and shortly thereafter, it came back, and it won its battle. But the thing that we have to keep in mind is that this planet is a better place for the fact that Tristan Faulkner was there fighting for justice, social, economic, political justice. And I'm reminded of when Vin Diesel's comments on the death of his friend and coworker, Paul Walker, and he said, so long, buddy. And I say to Tristan, so long, buddy.